Good evening. I'm Mark Gary. I'm the Executive Vice Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, and I am delighted to invite to welcome all of you here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to JTS for the Gershon D. Cohen Memorial Lecture. Our program tonight, as you know, will feature Dr. Mary C. Boys and Dr. Shuli Rubin Schwartz in conversation on the topic anti-Semitism in America, how did we get here, and how can we move forward? A timely topic, if there ever was one. At this time, uh, allow me to remind you to please take a moment and silence your cell phones, please. <clears throat> Some of you may be here for the first time, and so I'd like to particularly uh, welcome you to JTS and hope that you'll join us in the future on many uh, future occasions. Um, I'm also delighted to welcome all of our live stream viewers. It's wonderful that we are able to share tonight's thought-provoking program with you. We are pleased and excited that the following synagogues and other organizations have partnered with JTS by holding public screenings of tonight's program. And so I'd like to extend a very special welcome to the Emmanuel Synagogue, West Hartford, Connecticut, Tiferet Israel Congregation, Washington, D.C., Chizik Amuna Congregation in Baltimore, Maryland, Congregation Share Shemaim in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and Congregation Beth Orr, Maple Glen, Pennsylvania. This annual lecture was established in 1993 by the late Honorable Howard M. Holtzman, who is the honorary chair of the JTS Board of Trustees, as a tribute to the late Gershon D. Cohen, an acclaimed scholar of Jewish history and an inspiring leader who served as JTS Chancellor from 1972 to 1986. At this time, I would also like to remember Chancellor Cohen's beloved wife, Dr. Naomi W. Cohen, who passed away since last year's Cohen Memorial Lecture. An alumna of JTS, Dr. Cohen was a prominent historian of American Jewry who served on the faculty of Hunter College and as adjunct distinguished service professor of American Jewish history here at JTS. And she taught and mentored one of tonight's speakers, Dr. Shuli Rubin Schwartz. May the memories of both Chancellor Gershon D. Cohen and Dr. Naomi W. Cohen be for a blessing. I am now pleased to welcome and introduce tonight's distinguished presenters. First, Dr. Mary C. Boyce, who is Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean and Skinner and McAlpin Professor of Practical Theology at Union Theological Seminary here in New York, right across the street. She is the author of several books, including Jewish Christian Dialogue, One Woman's Experience, and Has God Only One Blessing, Judaism as a Source of Christian Self-Understanding. Dr. Boys serves as co-director of the Lilly Endowment-sponsored Religious Pluralism, Particularism and Pluralism Project that involved Jewish and Catholic educators and academics. She is a member of the Committee on Religion, Ethics, and the Holocaust at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and the National Catholic Center for Holocaust Education at Seton Hall University. She served on the Advisory Committee for the Secretariat for Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs of the United States Catholic Bishops, and has long been a member of the Sisters of the Holy Names of Jesus and Mary, a congregation of Roman Catholic women. Dr. Boys, who has served as an adjunct faculty member here at JTS, was awarded an honorary degree by JTS in 2011 in recognition of her many contributions to Jewish-Christian relations. Dr. Shuli Rubin Schwartz is provost, Salah and Walter Schlesinger, dean of the Gershon Kext Graduate School, and Irving Lehrman, Research Associate Professor of American Jewish History at JTS. She focuses her research, writing, and teaching on American Jewish life, history, and culture, 
as well as Jewish gender studies. The author of numerous articles on modern Judaism and Jewish life, her book, The Rabbi's Wife, The Rebetzin in American Jewish Life, won the National Jewish Book Award in the category of Modern Jewish Thought. From 1993 to 2018, Dr. Schwartz served with distinction as Dean of the Albert A. List College of Jewish Studies, JTS's undergraduate school, strengthening its dual degree programs with Columbia University and Barnard College. As Dean of the Gershon Kext Graduate School, she spearheaded the creation of a new MA program in Jewish ethics, which is the first of its kind in the entire United States. Dr. Schwartz has served for many years on the Academic Council of the American Jewish Historical Society. It is now my great privilege to call Dr. Royce and Dr. Schwartz to the platform to present tonight's important program. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. And we look forward to this conversation with all of you. Um, we hope to address the central question of the evening. Why has anti-Semitism persisted throughout history and how can we move forward given the most recent events? A little bit of background, Mary, my friend and colleague Mary and I have been co-teaching for almost a decade and the most recent course that we taught was on Jewish Christian relations. We taught the course last spring and it was extremely powerful both for us and for our students. We learned so much from that experience and we felt that it could inform and provide us with some answers to our questions this evening. So we will review the trajectory of anti-Semitism over time, try to account for its persistence, and suggest ways to move forward. And we'll do this together in a sort of conversational manner with uh, time for questions and answers at the end. We have to begin on the night of October 27th, just almost two months ago. It was a Saturday, Shabbat. I sort of heard some rumors that there was a shooting in Pittsburgh at a synagogue, but no details. It was only after Shabbat when I turned on my phone and began to read what had happened that I was overwhelmed, as I'm sure so many of you were as well, overwhelmed with emotion, stunned by what had happened. My heart went out to that community. I quickly did some Jewish geography in my head to figure out who did I know, who should I reach out to in the Pittsburgh Jewish community. And then I turned back to my phone and uh, tried to reach my my immediate family, my children, my siblings, because I knew that each one of them was stunned and grieving as well. The next time I looked at my phone, the first text that I received that evening was from Mary. Mary wrote, we are sick about this tragedy in Pittsburgh and send our love. That text meant the world to me it reminded me that it was not only in my small bubble that that pain was so acute, but there were others that shared that pain with me. So I have spoken at a synagogue in Squirrel Hill. It was 12 years ago, and I don't really remember what the synagogue was. It was in the discussion and controversy over the Mel Gibson film. The Passion of the Christ. Uh, I have friends from Squirrel Hill. Uh, 
But there was another set of feelings, and you will see those feelings tonight, and that is my own responsibility as a Christian and the wounds that my own tradition has inflicted on the Jewish people over time. And I intend tonight to speak as frankly as possible about this. Uh, that history is uh, a tragedy, and it brings deep shame to me, but I don't think that denying that this history exists or just ignoring it will in any way lead to reconciliation. And so I will be saying some hard things about the Christian tradition, but it is the tr tradition to which I am, have been affiliated all of my life. So. <clears throat> I knew that to fully understand what happened in Pittsburgh, we needed to go back to begin to explore how anti-Semitism developed over time. And so I was grateful that when I turned to Mary and asked if she would join me on this podium this evening to try to explore that together, she gratefully agreed to well, do so. Well, she's the provost. <laughs> I wasn't going to say no. <laughs> So while what happened in Pittsburgh made everyone think about American anti-Semitism, and we'll get there this evening, we need to go back, to go back in time to the first century of the Common Era, to the origins of the period of time when both Judaism and Christianity were in formation. So Mary, how do you understand the connection between anti-Semitism and this period of origin. One of the first things I think we have to do is recognize that to speak of Judaism and Christianity in the first century of the Common Era is an anachronism. So what I'd like to do is to invite you to imagine a time when what became rabbinic Judaism and what became Christianity is not yet there. So we might imagine instead that we have a movement out of, say, biblical Israel. By that I mean four things in particular. That in general, Jews ob observed circumcision, Shabbat, the dietary laws, abstention from pork, which isn't to say that all Jews then did it the same way or to the same degree of intensity. They worshiped God without graven images, which was unusual in the ancient world. They were deeply tied to the temple in Jerusalem. They sent in from the diaspora, as well as uh, in the Palestine itself, they sent in their half shekel, uh, their contribution to the treasury of the temple. So Jews were a distinctive people, but they weren't socially separate. They weren't entirely in any way, no, disconnected from the Gentile world, the Greco-Roman world. Uh, one could convert to Judaism. And we also know that there were many people who were proselytes, never really converted, but they were very attracted, especially by the ethics of Jews. When we get to the second century before the Common Era, we begin to have voluntary groups forming. And we know some of them by name, although I think we know less about them than we like to think we do. So we have these groups, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, who are associated with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and then a little later, we have another Jewish group that forms, and I'm gonna call it, following some many scholars, the Jesus Movement, or Jesus' Movement, which is actually, I think, better because the movement was never really primarily about Jesus, but about what he taught. And then later in the century, of the first century, you have the, when the, sort of the build up to the war with Rome, you have the zealots and the, and the assassins, the Sicarii. Now, one of the things that's so important to understand is that in the world of antiquity, both religious groups and philosophers felt very deeply about their own interpretations of how you, how you lived. So, of course, there were many differing interpretations of Torah. And the thing that I think is most memorable about this is that in, in a sense, defending your own particular interpretation or your own particular philosophical tradition, you argued vociferously and you were not concerned about fairness to the other group. And so 
uh, there was a great deal of uh, what we could call vilifying one's opponents. And in a sense, you could say that there are two problems that come out of this rhetoric of antiquity that become very troublesome because they get picked up into the text of the New Testament. And that is the binary of good, we are good, you are evil. And then associated with that, the second characteristic is disparagement of the other, vilifying the other. And in some cases, that vilifying went as far as demonization. And it's really a tragedy, and especially in hindsight, that those characteristics were part of our sacred text, but it, it is simply the case. Now, just a word about what becomes rabbinic Judaism. After the destruction of the temple, it looks like that the primary group of sort of leading Jews are the Pharisees, and it's really out of the Pharisaic movement that rabbinic Judaism is going to develop in the second, third, and fourth century, and I won't say too much more about that because I'll be out of my depth very fast. But I want to talk now about the Jesus movement, and I want to speak about it uh, at two phases. So the first phase is associated with Jesus of Nazareth, a Jewish teacher who spoke primarily and taught primarily in Judea and Galilee. Uh, his students, if you will, his disciples were all Jews. There was no question about that. And it seems, at least as much as we can tell, that they had limited interaction with non-Jews or Gentiles. Um, then in the th about 33, we don't have the exact dates and times and so forth, but most likely April of, 19 of, of the year 33 of the first century, Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judea, put Jesus to death by crucifixion. And by the way, tens of thousands of Jews were crucified during the Roman Empire. So Jesus was not alone by any stretch of the imagination. But then there takes a distinctive turn. Rather soon after the death of Jesus, disciples claim that they see him now alive. And they assert that God has raised Jesus from the dead. So now the reflection, the teaching, the ritualizing that's going on is not simply about God's imminent kingdom, but also about Jesus as God's agent or God's anointed one, God's Mashiach. Now, there are two other related developments. One is Paul, a faithful Jew who has a mystical experience in which he sees himself deeply sort of drawn to this Jesus, the risen Jesus, and he receives what, what we can see today is a call to preach this to the Gentiles around the Mediterranean. Paul sees himself still, as best we can figure out, as an Israelite who is a follower of Jesus. We don't have that category so much today, except maybe something like Jews for Jesus. Uh, but in that, at that time period, first of all, there's no Christianity yet. So, this, and there are, I think, a number of people who are, uh, have a similar point of view. But Paul went around the Mediterranean and by the end of the first century of the Common Era, you have a lot of Gentiles or non-Jews who are part of this movement. And there are some tensions within between, if you will, the Jesus-following Jews and the Jesus-following non-Jews. So just a couple things more to say about this. There's an argument now that happens both within the Jesus movement or Jesus' movement and between Jesus' movement, and particularly between that movement and the Pharisees, because the Pharisees are kind of the most visible leaders. And we see this in some of the passages in the New Testament. I'm just going to quote one and just a little bit of it. It's Matthew 23. And this is uh, really a diatribe by Jesus, although this is written probably around 85 of the first century. So Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. 
And then he goes on about they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on the shoulders of others, but they don't take them on themselves. And they do all their deeds to be seen by others. They make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Julie, have you ever uh, heard that? I, I have to say, um, it's very clear that Matthew is a Jewish book because what you've just read, I hear every day. <laughs> Today, <laughs> we Jews are so good at criticizing our own leaders who fail to practice what they preach or who seem to be a little too big for their britches. So, so it's this a long tradition of this. Yeah, and I think this is a diatribe about what happens when religiosity goes amok. When you become so impressed with your own piety that, and, and what's unfortunate is that for many Christians in learning about texts like this, we make the Pharisees the bad guys. Instead of understanding this is an internal critique about, you know, a religiosity that's genuine. The other passage, and I'm not going to quote the passages, but just to say that in the Gospel of John, which is probably the latest of the four canonical Gospels, there's now something that in some passages really rises to what we would call demonization. And there are two things in particular, and I have to say in, to do this in a synagogue is actually very hard. But in John 8, 44, Jesus is cited as saying, and remember, these are not documentaries. These are from probably 70-plus uh, years after the time of Jesus. You are children of the devil. And in John's gospel, distinctively, the generalization is not is always the Jews. Hoi, you die away. Not some Jews or the Pharisees or whatever, as it is in the other gospels. And then the final thing that I'd say about John's gospel is that when John tells the story of the death of Jesus, he emphasizes the complicity of, again, the Jews. And that is the theological root of anti-Semitism. I think it's the North Star, it's the most important uh, aspect. So what happens is that these debates that were, from the beginning, familial debates. They were intense, they were argued in the same language that the people, the educated people of antiquity used. But what happens is when that later generations read them, they don't understand the context, either the rhetorical context or the historical context. And there's a saying by the late uh, Swedish Lutheran, a biblical scholar, Christer Stendhal, that I think explains it very well. He says, words like that, the demonization of Jews, grow legs and they walk right out of context. And that is one of the great tragedies of our sacred literature. And then finally, uh, Shuli asked me to, to give an example from the later period. And again, now this is from uh, the late uh, uh, fourth century, early fifth century from John Chrysostom. Uh, he has, I think, the dubious honor of being the most vituperative and vindictive of the literary elite, and he wrote eight homilies against the Judaizers, that is, people who were following Jewish customs and Christian customs, because again, there's still not, there, the border is maybe drawn by the elites, but not by the common people. So I looked through sort of my, some of my collection of John Chrysostom, and I, I just kept eliminating ones that I couldn't read in a synagogue, but I think this one short one, um, shows you how this binary is at work. There's truth and there's falsity. So, John Chrysostom, Discourse 1. Finally, if the ceremonies of the Jews move you to admiration, because people were going down to the big synagogue, what do you have in common with us, people in his storefront church? If the Jewish ceremonies are venerable and great, ours are lies. But if ours are true, as they are true, theirs are filled with deceit. It's a zero-sum game. And we so recognize this because it's still the easiest way when you're trying to figure out who you are is to figure out who you aren't and demonize the other, and that can help you feel like you are in possession of the truth. But in fact, probably the system is so critical of the Jews because that little storefront church it's across the street from a big synagogue, 
that's filled with Jews and probably filled with some of his congregation, congregation of early Christians who still are enamored with the Jewish holidays. So on the holidays, they're still going to go to the big synagogue across the street. And we might recognize that also today, where leaders will want to boast that there is the place theirs is the place with the bigger attendance. Theirs has the bigger house of worship. And he's not there yet. So it's easier to demonize your opponents than to really confront who they are and who you are. And I think this literary elite acted as like the border control. They were trying to build a wall between the church. I don't know why I happened to pick up I don't the know term of the wall. I just, it just came. <laughs> uh, and I guess what we have now, it, by this point, we have the rhetoric of, of invidious contrast. And when we were working on this lecture, one of the things we both uh, began to talk about is how important words are and how destructive words of hate are. And, um, but again, as Shuley pointed out, this polemical, this, this rhetoric of invidious contrast was primarily meant to assure the followers of Jesus that they were the true Israel. And it was unimaginable to them that there could be more than one ways of following Torah or, true, or to be true Israel. So unfortunately, as we move forward to the Middle Ages, uh, and we work, uh, move to a time where Christianity becomes first the official religion of the Roman Empire, and then Christianity comes to be the dominant religion throughout Europe, Jews become the quintessential other, and this rhetoric, not only was it said, but it is in these sacred texts, all of this rhetoric of demonization is there to be accessed. And unfortunately, in the Middle Ages, to be accessed by the majority that is in power. Now, similarly, in the Middle Ages, for certainly much of the Middle Ages, you have the same kind of distinction that Mary was talking about between the elite and the masses of uh, both Jews and Christians. And on the level of social interaction and um, uh, just in, in the ways in which they lived, there are very close ties between Jews and Christians in Europe during the Middle Ages. You have uh, lots of evidence of them uh, doing business together, you have evidence of Christian midwives delivering Jewish babies. Uh, and you also have, um, on the level of uh, even uh, the, the way people thought and believed and understood their world, you had Jews and Christians sharing a common religious language. I'm not sure they would have seen that, but as scholars look back on that period, they have very similar views on religious extremism, on martyrdom, on um, scholasticism, to name just a few. But unfortunately, this rhetoric, this binary distinction between good and evil, between winners and losers, continues to dominate. Uh, for Christianity, that rhetoric, that Jews must survive in the world, but Jews must suffer, because for Jews to suffer proves theologically that the, the only way to thrive in this world is to accept Christ. And if Jews are witnesses to what happens when you don't do that, and so the inferior position of the Jews is, is uh, kind of the basis for the status of Jews throughout the Middle Ages. 
In 1096, Pope Urban II called for Christians to reclaim the Holy Land from the infidels. And uh, many Christians, particularly probably those who were not so happy living under the feudal system and were eager to try to make some kind of better life for themselves, figured they'd go to Palestine and do that. Uh, but some Christians realized that actually there were infidels right in their own backyard. Those infidels were not Muslims, but Jews. And uh, it's a very, uh, was a very painful moment in Jewish history. And thanks to the uh, chronicles of uh, s those who survived, we have um, some very poignant uh, chronicles of the, de this, of the death and destruction and martyrdom of many Jews on, along the, the Rhine, uh, in Jewish communities along the Rhineland. Now, it's not, it's not clear how many Jews uh, were murdered during this time, but the trauma on the Jewish community of their friends and neighbors and business associates um, who um, attacked the Jews was very long-standing. I'm going to read a short passage from this, uh, from one of the Chronicles. Who has seen or heard of an act like the deed of the righteous, pious, young mistress, Rachel? She said to her friends, Four children have I. Have no mercy on them either, lest those uncircumcised ones come and seize them alive and raise them in their ways of error. In my children, too, shall you sanctify the holy name of God. This pious woman sacrificed her four living children lest they be um, murdered at the hands of the Christians who were at at her gates. It is, it is of her that it was said, the mother was dashed in pieces with her children when the father saw the death of his four children, beautiful in form and appearance, he cried bitterly and threw himself on the sword in his hand. See, O Lord, and behold, how abject I have become. Reading these passages recalls probably the moment of highest tension in the class that Mary and I taught last spring, which had an equal number of students from here at JTS and from Union Theological Seminary across the street. The Jewish students were overcome with emotion because it rekindled their anger at the suffering of Jews during this period. And it was all the more painful because they were reading this history in the presence of the other. The Christian students were appalled to learn this painful history of violence committed in the name of religion that they hold dear. But this moment also proved to be a turning point in the class because as we learned and as we learned again and again and again in this class, there's something so important about confronting these texts, as painful as they are, together. With complete honesty, holding all of that pain and understanding both where it came from and the lasting damage that such pain can cause. Sadly, this medieval anti-Semitism only becomes more obsessive, more irrational, and more violent over the next few centuries. Again, we can understand it. We understand it both theologically, and we also understand it because it's human nature. You add to the theological 
ways in which Judaism must be diminished relative to Christianity, and then you add the horrible fear and ignorance and superstition, for example, in the 14th century during the Black Death. One third of the population of Europe died as a result of the Black Death. That means everyone was grieving the loss of someone that they loved. Who wouldn't want to find a scapegoat? And in medieval Christendom, the scapegoat with a capital S were the Jews. So it's natural that rumors began to spread that Jews who are always washing themselves and going to the mikvah and washing before they break bread, they must have poisoned the wells. And because Jews hold no power in the medieval period, they suffered because that, those rumors then led to violence. Jews were murdered in certain communities, expelled from other communities, and uh, this ultimately will result in the expulsion of Jews from uh, the various um, either states or, or um, areas where they're not yet nation states throughout, uh, throughout Europe. So that by the 1492, the largest expulsion of Jews from Spain, and then uh, five years later from Portugal in 1497, you pretty much have no Jews in Europe. So I want to underline one thing that you said about our class, and that is that there was this one group knowing this history and feeling this history as their history, and then the Christians in the class, and Union is a multi-denominational school with more than just Christians, but primarily uh, so far uh, with Christians. For the most part, Christians don't know this history. And people would, you know, after class, students would come up to us and just say, I never knew, I mean, you know, they, they were so troubled. And so there were a few weeks there when I was so glad to be teaching with Shuley, but, you know, we really couldn't console people because this history is there, you know, to steal a line from Al Gore, it's an inconvenient truth and a painful truth. But that's especially, and I, I will say later on, just so you know, that when they began doing projects together, then the personal relationships developed and the tensions eased, and I think, I think they were, I think everybody was changed by it, I, I hope in, in positive ways. But I just wanna pick up on one thing uh, when we're kind of not quite to modernity, but I'm talk about for a minute the ghetto in Rome. And I want to come back to that later as a metaphor, but for now I want to stay with the actual physical ghetto. Uh, so in 1555, the Pope at the time, Paul uh, IV, decided that all Jews in Rome had to be rounded up and they were required to live in a seven acre section along the Tiber. It's, of course, it's a, quite a tourist area now, but you have to imagine <laughs> the conditions were ap appalling and the idea was that we had to make life so miserable for Jews that they would convert. And uh, one of the details of this uh, is that it, it, there's a church right there as you cross uh, the, the, uh, the bridge from the, on the other side of the Tiber, uh, the church of St. Uh, Gregory, San Gregorio. And uh, apparently Jews were made to stand and to listen to sermons to convert them. Now, with all due respect to the Christian clergy who are here, I've yet to hear, hear a sermon that would move me to conversion, but at any rate, uh, and apparently that many Jews came, they were forced to come, and they put wax in their ears so they wouldn't have to hear it. Uh, Jews are clever. <laughs> very clever. And today, if you go to Rome, that church is still there, and right across from it is the great synagogue. That was a different time. So we'll come back to this notion of, 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 of ghetto, but it, it's a, I think it's a highly symbolic move on the part of the official church of Catholicism. Okay, so I'd like to now move us into modernity.
uh, and uh, when Enlightenment ideals enter Western society, each country is faced with the question of figuring out what to do with its Jews as it evolves into a modern nation state. How can they reconcile ideals like liberté, égalité, fraternité with the Christian medieval views of Jews that were part of the soil of the continent. And each country devised its own answer to that question um, in large measure, kind of one of two ways. Either Jews can earn their rights, earn their equal rights, in other words, assimilate, get a secular education, uh, an occupation, change their names, etc., or some uh, some countries, France in particular, said, okay, we'll emancipate Jews right away, but then it just became a sort of unwritten expectation that once Jews were emancipated and gained equal rights as other citizens of the state, and what we see at this point is that the human need for scapegoating remains, of course. And as it remains, you begin to see other ways in which society understands this othering. So you see then what, what builds on the religious anti-Semitism of the medieval period and now morphs into a more um, uh, secular manifestations of anti-Semitism. So as Europeans refine their, their sense of themselves as members of modern nations, Jews become criticized. You remember that old trope of the medieval wandering Jew becomes the rootless cosmopolitan of modernity. Unease anger and displacement resulting from industrialization and the development of a modern economy, sound familiar? Targets Jews and there that builds on medieval stereotypes of Jews as greedy money lenders and Jews become blamed for the excesses of capitalism. Influenced by new developments in science, and the burgeoning field of anthropology, Jews are now othered in racial terms. Now it was their, gen their genetics that prove their racial inferiority. And finally, since anti-Semitism anti at its core is irrational, Jews are blamed for the ills of capitalism, but also of socialism. Those inferior nomadic Jews <clears throat> are also seen as conspiring with each other because they're so smart that they've figured out how to connect with Jews all over the world, to rule the world. The false truth of the protocols of the elders of Zion is, an, is a, you know, the prototype of that. So by the end of the 19th century, you have anti-Semitism anchored in religious tropes, but overlaid with nationalist, sociological, economic, political, racist, conspiratorial theories. Such hatred, as we heard before, hatred is a really great unifier, as we know today. And so it certainly helped unify Germany at the end of the 19th century. But of course, it also set the stage for what, in the specific context of the 20th century, led to the Holocaust and, of course, the attempted genocide of the Jews. So to what extent did anti-Semitism take root in the United States? <clears throat> we know that our country was founded by Europeans whose ancestors came here to escape religious persecution determined to establish a secular government, there is, has never been an established church in this country. 
the central documents of the Republic, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, assure Jews of liberty, and unlike any European document, they assure Jews of that liberty without mentioning them. Jews are citizens of this country. They never had to earn emancipation here, so they never had to fear losing it. And also, America's commitment to religious freedom and diversity, volunteerism, denominationalism, the separation of church and state, all of this assure a pluralism in which Jews are but one faith among many and protect against the binary that we've been talking about that leads so easily to anti-Semitism. Of course, European anti-Semitism found its way to the United States, and some of those prejudices are found here. And although there's never been an established church here, we all know that we live in a Christian, more accurately, a Protestant country. But because Jews have always felt secure in their status, they also always felt secure fighting back against anti-Semitism. They made full use of their freedom here and fought back against Christian missionizing in the 19th century and played a visible role in combating anti-Semitism in the 20th, when, for example, many of the ideas of racial anti-Semitism were brought to this country by Henry Ford and others. Thankfully, America's two-party politics, by and large, resists anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism anti is also only one among many hatreds in America. We know that our original sin as a nation is racism. And we also know that as Americans, Americans have been capable of hatred of many others, whether it's Catholics or Mormons or Quakers or immigrants. We see all of this in the amalgam of hatred spewed by white nationalists today. Over the decades, Jews have suffered from discrimination in this country as Jews social discrimination, job discrimination, housing discrimination, immigration quotas, etc. Anti-Semitism was especially acute during the years before World War II. The, the American Nazi organization held a big rally in Madison Square Garden in 1936. But in the post-Holocaust era, there was a tremendous decrease in anti-Semitism with Jews acculturating deeply into American life. Jews also act on their values in the public arena to combat racial equality. They're joined racial inequality. They are joined uh, by uh, priests and nuns that join that struggle as well. But even then, there are parallels to today. It was 70 years ago, almost to the day, that the, uh, the temple, as it was called in Atlanta, was bombed, part of the Confederate backlash against civil rights in the 50s, not unlike the motivation for the murders at the Tree of Life Synagogue, a synagogue that had put itself out there um, in, uh, in the forefront of welcoming refugees to this country. So, how do we see these post-war developments reflected in the Catholic Church, Mary? I'd just like to say uh, a little bit about uh, more recent history in the Catholic Church, although it's over 50 years ago, so it all depends how old you are if you think that that's recent, <laughs> but... Uh, <coughs> <coughs> so, um, well, first I wanna tell a story. Uh, in 1959, uh, Pope John the 23rd, uh, he, oh, 
been elected just a few months before, and he decided to call a church council. And um, so in the uh, preparation for that, bishops throughout the world were asked to send in recommendations for topics and themes and so forth. And of the thousands of pages of recommendations, there was not one from a bishop about repairing our relationship with the Jewish people. There was, however, a French historian, Jules Isaac, who had, during the war years, been hidden uh, by a Catholic woman in rural France, and he researched the history of what Christianity had been teaching about Jews and Judaism. And he called this the teaching of contempt. And he had many Christian friends. He was very well thought of, one of the prime historians in France at the time. And in uh, June of 1960, Isaac, who was 83 at the time, met with Pope William. John XXIII, who was 78. And I tell this story because sometimes we think, you know, your life is over to make big changes. <laughs> and something happened between these two men. It was a relatively short uh, time together. And... Pope John turned to his friend, Wonder Cardinal Bale, who later became a very close friend of Abraham Joshua Heschel, and asked him to Can see to it that it got on the agenda of the Second Vatican Council. No, Ultimately, the council now. prepared a document called, in Latin, Nostra Aetate, In Our Time. It's not a perfect document. Uh, it's uh, a flawed text. It was too cautious. It went through five drafts. It was the most controversial. Uh, yeah, but know, since that time, uh, there's been a real with, uh, commitment in the churches, because it was also a catalyst to other Christian churches. And f from that time, we have seen an incredible growth in, so that, for instance, I, I'm four, not saying this two, is all four. because of Vatican II, but really, I think our respective ancestors would be incredulous that there's a dictionary of Jewish-Christian relations. There's the Jewish annotated New Testament, now in its second edition. There are chairs in Christian-Jewish studies all over universities in the United States and Canada. Uh, so I, I'm not naive. I realize that anti-Semitism uh, hasn't disappeared. Uh, there are many, many Christians who still have the not the foggiest idea how to interpret our texts in their historical context and their literary context. So it's, there's an immense job still to do. But I keep thinking of that meeting of these three elderly men in Rome in 1960 as, in a sense, a turning point that nobody anticipated. Now, I want to go back, just having said some good news, I want to go back to some more sobering news, and that is the, the, the metaphor of ghetto. In uh, Isaac's notes that he wrote uh, shortly after the visit with the Pope, he said, how can I, in a short time, explain to him the consequences of the physical ghetto, but also the spiritual ghetto? And I think that, uh, I call that a theological ghetto. That is, many Christians, I would say overwhelmingly most Christians, I haven't done any statistical study of this, I don't have any uh, empirical data, but have a very constricted notion of Judaism and only know how to think about Judaism from our own categories. And so it seems to me that this is our task in our time, is to have opportunity, to take up, uh, advantage of opportunities of Christians and Jews to study together, to be together, to simply go to coffee together, so that Christians learn or they unlearn their stereotypes by actually getting to know people who are, who are knowledgeable about Judaism. And then uh, finally, I just want to make one little story uh, about the ghetto. And that is the last time I was there, <coughs> uh, I, I, was, I went to buy some water and I stopped in a little bakery. And there on the wall of the bakery is a picture of Pope Francis. I said, this is not your ancestor's ghetto. And, and thanks be to God. And then as we're coming in, I don't, when I come to the synagogue, I normally come in and up the stairs. 
and I'm walking with Shuley, and there's Francis here. How history would have been different if our religious leaders had known each other as human beings? Amen. That I would, I, I just want to close, I would say, and kind of bring this to a close by reminding us that Mary's story and her example is a reminder to us of how important it is to be in close conversation with each other, to be, have experiences and feel that sense of comfort in each other's houses of worship not only during sad times, although that was so important, but through the normal cycle of our years and our lives. We saw the impact of that in our class. I have not a doubt, not a sliver of a doubt, that the careers of the clerk of the clergy in training who studied with us in that class, their ministry, their rabbinates, will be different because of that experience of learning from each other, of learning together some of our painful history, and of um, spending time getting to know each other, and then working to prepare presentations in which they couldn't paper over their differences. They had to work through those differences in order to present in a meaningful and uh, deep and serious way. In addition to this message of not only that words matter, but our actions matter, I think it's also important just to highlight what Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs points out, and that is that anti-Semitism, in a way, is like the canary in the coal mine. It is a danger signal not only for Jews, but it is a danger signal for society at large. Because when anti-Semitism begins to rear its head, we know that hatred in all forms is about to rear its head. And that it is, a, it is a threat to freedom, to human dignity, and to the makeup of a democratic society. So this is something that we need to confront, not only we Jews, but that all of us, certainly all of us as Americans, must confront for it's an ominous sign for democracy, what we experienced uh, these last, really, several years. So I've called attention to a few of the problematic texts in the New Testament. I'd like to end with, with a, a metaphor that we get from Genesis and from Proverbs, the Eitz Hayim, the Tree of Life, and of course thinking of the synagogue in Pittsburgh, but we also have a reference to the Tree of Life in the Book of Revelation, which is the final book in the canon of the Christian New Testament. And it seems to me, well, I'm just going to read it. On either side of the river is the Tree of Life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And so perhaps that you know, with a text like this, we can think of what healing we can bring, the healing of the nations. So may all of us nurture the trees of life through our words and through our actions and through our relationships. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for participating in conversation this evening. Um, I, we, we have some time for questions. So uh, for those of you in the room, if you have questions, please approach this microphone. And uh, we also very much want to include questions from those on live stream. And so 
hopefully we'll have an opportunity to do that as well. Hi, thank, you, thank you for that, by the way. Um, th this is not a question, it's a comment. I think most people do not have hatred in them. I think most people have love in them. And I went to the synagogue where the Tree of Life congregants were davening two weeks after October 27th to daven with them. It was at Congregation Rodef Shalom in Pittsburgh. And there were about 200 people there. And I would say a third were not Jewish. And there were people from all over the world there. And behind me were four Hindus. And I went over to them and I said, this isn't my home, but I'm glad you're here. Thank you for being here. And they said to me, we are one people. And that really says it all. So I think there's love more than hate. Thank you. Hi, I have a question from our live stream audience from Tiferet Israel in Washington, D.C. And I guess the question is mostly for Dr. Boyce, but for either of you. The question is as follows. Can we trace the roots of anti-Semitism to the decision of Emperor Constantine to make Christianity the official and sole religion of the previously pantheistic Roman Empire? Well, it actually wasn't Constantine, it's two emperors later, but that, that's a small point. Uh, I, I think it has started earlier. I think that, the, that there were these tensions, there were these rivalries, and the rivalries hardened into, you know, into hate. And the, the language, the rhetoric of antiquity is part of the problem. Uh, the failure of religious leaders to, you know, that they were so busy doing border control, they forgot that you have to have a place to cross the border. And uh, so I don't think that we can exculpate uh, the church or the, as it developed uh, by blaming it on the state, but it's also a tragedy that the church became the official, or that Christianity became the official religion of the, of the Roman Empire. I think, yes, that's a tragedy. Okay, you, as you pointed out, it's human nature to want to scapegoat. Um, during the Black Death, I'm sure many, many, many Jews died. And I'm wondering, did they have a scapegoat? Who did they blame? for what had happened. They didn't blame the Jews. Uh, I ask it not just as a historical curiosity, although I am curious, but bringing it to modern times. We do see a resurgence of anti-Semitism in the world. What do the Jews blame it on? It's too simplistic to say Donald, Donald Trump or to name another thing in the same way that Adolf Hitler wouldn't have risen the way he rose if there hadn't been terrible economic problems. You don't need me to tell you history. So the question is, who do the Jews either scapegoat or justifiably call out? Okay, so first, while it certainly is human nature to, hatred is part of human nature, it is certainly not true, um, as, our, as our first common commentator noted, it's certainly not true that all of us hold hate in our hearts or um, act on that hatred. So I don't think that we need to uh, find the source of hate for every human being. I would say that Jews, Jews unfortunately, given uh, Jewish history, Jews more likely uh, respond to these, um, these periods not so much with finding their scapegoats, but rather with a sense of victimhood. Right? Oh, they're out to get us again. Right? And it's sort of that persecution complex that um, can be toxic for Jews to not be able to kind of get out of that sense that everything that happens just proves that everyone's always out to get us. Please. Yes, uh, Dr. Boys. Since you were speaking of reading historically and contextualizing, I was wondering, in terms of the verse from John, do we have to read it as John saying, Jesus, the Son of God incarnate, is saying, you Jews are the devil, or based on what the original text says? Rather than that theological reading, can, can't we read it as Jesus the Galilean is saying, you Judeans are the devil, which is a political statement? 
Well, that's certainly possible. It's also possible since John's gospel comes late, so roughly 60 to 70 years after, after Jesus' death, resurrection. And you don't have, you don't have the same uh, documentary recording devices and so forth. So there's an oral tradition that goes on, and it seems like that there's some particular tensions between the, some of the communities out of which this gospel came. I personally find it hard to believe that Jesus himself would have said that. I can see, because you know, we, don't have ex we don't have recordings of what Jesus said. The gospels don't quote him exactly. You know, we have two versions of the Our Father. We have a Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain. You know, the, those of you who are students of the Bible know that these are the kinds of, these are the characteristics of ancient texts. So I think it probably comes from these tension, internal tensions uh, uh, much later. But there are, you're right to point out some of the curiosities. There's a, there's a very odd text in the 20th chapter of John's Gospel where it's the Easter Sunday night and the disciples are gathered together, as the narrator says, in the upper room for fear of the Jews. Now what's odd about that is that everybody in the room is <laughs> Jewish. Jewish. <laughs> so there's, that word Jew is a pretty complicated term and sometimes it means Judean. And when does Judaism become a religion? You know, it's a culture, it's a people, but there's some, uh, some theories that, and this Daniel Boyarin in particular, that Judaism becomes a religion when Christianity becomes a religion. But then, as one of my colleagues says, what is a religion anyway? And, and so we, you know, we could, uh, I think I better get out of this before I... <laughs> so thank you for your question. For, for Dr. Boys, uh, regarding the deicide accusation, Without the crucifixion and the resurrection, there's no Christianity. This is God's design for humanity according to Christianity. So if the Jews are complicit with the Romans in the crucifixion of Jesus, why are they blamed and not given credit? That's not the first time I've had this question. So uh, uh, first let me say, I think that before we get to theological reasons why Jesus died, we have to look at the historical reasons. And uh, frankly, given the uh, Roman Empire and Pontius Pilate, to crucify one more Jew, I mean, uh, you know, Jesus was associated with people who, who preached and practiced virtues, let's call them a uh, moral life that went over against Rome. So he was probably regarded as a, as a threat and inconvenient. Uh, so, and historically, as best we can tell, there may have been involvement of, of some Jews, but Rome had all the power. So you can't, I mean, Jews didn't have the power to, of, of execution. So th the problem is that Jews are blamed out of the tensions that come up later and uh, so, yes, you're right, without the crucifixion and the, especially the resurrection, but it's not just the crucifixion, and this is the thing that I think is where Christianity has got its own sort of theological ghetto, not about Jews so much. We place, I'm aware that this is live stream and God knows who's listening to this. Uh, <laughs> hello, Pope Francis. Um, we focus so much on the cross, the crucifixion, that we lose sight of the fact that Jesus is the primary teacher for us. And so it's not just the crucifixion as this magic act that saves us, but the whole way that Jesus preaches. Christianity is a way of life. Before we were called Christians, we were called followers of the way. And I think that's, so it's really the ministry of Jesus that's so powerful. And yes, and, he's, and he suffers death as a consequence of his ministry. And otherwise you get into this thing that God sends Jesus to die, as if that's, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, skewed notion of God, it seems to me. I hope that somewhat addresses your question. Uh, Dr. Boyce, I was struck by your describing the, the early uh, sources of anti-Semitism, sort of a new faith movement that, um, uh, felt, I guess, insecure and defined itself by defining another. 
And I wonder if that's sort of been over history and, and certainly in recent times, a similar problem, that there's a crisis of, of identity, crisis of confidence, and that it's a spawning ground for anti-Semitism and, and other hates. And if part of the problem is not so much dialogue between Christians and Jews, but sort of a reinvigorating of the Christian faith and what, it, what its message is and reaching more people who otherwise just have these vestigial uh, ways of defining Jews and defining their own identity. I think that's true in, in, in uh, it's a little difficult. Christianity is such a diverse and huge kind of world. So I think that, first of all, most Christians live in places in the world where there are very few Jews, or if any. So I would just focus on this country then, just for the yeah, sake of it. So, but I mean, yeah. that's part yeah. of our, our, our yeah. big problem, especially because like Latin America, it was, oh, especially Africa, where it's yeah. so fast growing. Um, so, so those sacred texts play a, a pernicious role there too, those passages. Mm. So I think in this country, I think, I think relationships have been developed in many places because uh, we have scholarly groups that work together. We, we share one another's literature and your specializations and so forth. Uh, I think the issue is sort of what's on the ground and you know, do people know, know each other beyond uh, stereotypes? On the other hand, you know, it's, it's Christmas time and all of the Christmas songs that I'm not so crazy about because they don't have any religious depth, but you, you, you people wrote them all. <laughs> Irving Berlin, St. Irving Berlin, you know. So uh, I'm kind of wandering, so you can, you can answer the rest, Julie. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm a Columbia JTS grad of 2017. And for those that aren't aware of the Columbia news, but a couple weeks ago, a Jewish history professor at uh, TC Teachers College got their office vandalized with swastikas. And that was awful. And then a week and a half later, uh, Columbia students started hurling slurs at minority students on campus. Uh, so my question is, very broadly, what do you think happens next? And what should institutions like JTS and Columbia put out that's not a uh, we stand with students? We should do what our, what our mission is, right? Which is education. I think it goes to um, why we chose to do this this evening as an educational tool. And I think that that's something we need to do more of. You know very well, despite the many, many hours you spent in class in a dual degree program, that most education in college, as in life, happens outside of formal arenas, happens outside of class. And when individuals stay, within their own comfort zone, they are not making the most of their education, particularly in a place that's as diverse as Columbia is. And that's what needs to happen. There need, we need to build those relationships and learn deeply from each other. And that's the only way that you can break down. You know, you can, you can vandalize someone's office if you have no idea who that person is, but you just know that she teaches Holocaust studies, and therefore, you put a swastika there. But if there were actual relationships, then you, we go a long way uh, towards addressing these issues of hate. Thanks. Hey, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much. This was really, um, I think, very inspiring to have this evening to do this work Thank and you. my question I guess mainly goes to my dear colleague Mary but I, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of how there's one there's one issue to be dealt with around some of the atrocities in our <laughs> sacred texts right which people debate whether you can actually change a text by you know not literally translating it like in the Gospel of John that's one mm -hmm. whole issue right. uh, but then there's our liturgy and especially for those of us in churches that are 
called liturgical churches, like Catholic, Episcopal, which I am, Lutheran, uh, people almost get as, they think the, the liturgies are as sacrosanct as the scripture. And our liturgies, I mean, if you go to the Good Friday liturgy of our traditions, it is awash in Jew blaming. And uh, aside from doing education in congregations, but how do we take that mantle of, of untouchability off of our liturgies and begin to be more creative so that we aren't perpetuating these things? Because people hear these things Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Any ideas beyond just more educational forums? <laughs> Uh, there's an Episcopal priest, retired now, a, a scholar of Bible, John Townsend, who wrote a sort of a harmony uh, uh, for, uh, for the reading of the Passion. So he is a, is a very good scholar, so it's not just thrown together. And it avoids some of the problematics of reading the Gospel of John on Good Friday. There's also a Canadian scholar uh, who has devoted much of his retired life to studying uh, alternatives in the liturgy, and I agree with you that I think um, liturgical reform is a necessity. At, at least one needs to preach over against the text. Right. Uh, right. You can <clears> preach against the text. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in many churches, uh, there will be a citation from Nostra Aetate, uh, uh, you know, uh, about not blaming the Jews for the death of Jesus. But when you have the whole liturgy and you proclaim dramatically, uh, and, and the Jews as the people say, crucify him, crucify him. Well, it, that little note in the bulletin doesn't go very far. So, <laughs> so yes, I quite agree. And uh, yes, we, we need a reform of the liturgy. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Last question. Um, there's, there's a new flavor and a newly respectable flavor of anti-Semitism in America and particularly in the academy. And that is an anti-Semitism which is made respectable um, because of of criticism of the state of Israel mm -hmm. and because of criticism of, of the treatment of the Palestinians. And um, I'm just concerned with the um, increasing respectability that it gets and, and, and also the fact that um, it, it is very difficult to uncouple in many people's minds on both sides the um, the state of Israel from, from Judaism. But I feel that particularly, well, in the United States, but in Europe particularly, it becomes a way of making anti-Semitism respectable intellectually and culturally yet again. Great. Uh, thank you for bringing this up. Um, yes, w one of the things that is so um, challenging about the contemporary manifestations of anti-Semitism is that you have them both on the right as well as on the left. And you are describing a kind of anti-Semitism on the left that is, in a way, in my understanding, simply the latest manifestation of anti-Semitism. Yes, it is now respectable to say, oh, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm anti-Israel, right? But look, you think about racial theories that were anti-Semitic in the late 19th century. It had the imprimatur of the latest scientific theories, right? So that, that th the, the tendency, the impulse, to attach one's bigotry to science or to objective truth, we understand, sadly, that only too well, that uh, truth, sadly, becomes a relative term. It is, however, um, dangerous, pernicious. It has all of the hallmarks of anti-Semitism, and I think that um, it is, you know, it is a willful elision of those terms in order to uh, perpetrate rabid anti-Semitism, in my opinion. That is not to say that there isn't legitimate criticism of what's going on in is the state of Israel's political um, policies, and Jews are hardy critics. Some Jews are hardy critics of, of government actions, but that's very different 
from what you're describing, which is, in my opinion, anti-Semitism, pure and simple. Thank you. Um, OK, looks like we're running out of time. Thank you all for being here. Thank you again, Dr. Boyce.